Hi, my name is Patrick Mercier. I'm an associate professor at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, and today I'll be talking about how to build lithium ion compatible DC-DC converters in scaled CMOS. So the requirement for uh, most modern IoT mobile device uh, sort of applications is that we power our SOCs uh, from a lithium ion battery. Uh, this requires a DC-DC converter that can operate from 2.8 volts uh, all the way up to 4.2 volts, uh, according to the lithium ion battery range, and convert voltages down to, say, between 0.5 volts and about 1 volt or so. So this presents a challenge in scaled CMOS um, because most scaled CMOS processes do not have transistors that can support such high voltages. Most don't have 5 volt or 4.2 volt transistors. Uh, and so what we typically do in, in conventional applications is we'll implement a power management integrated circuit in an older CMOS process technology, for example, 0.18 micron, something like this, uh, which has higher voltage transistors that can uh, support the conversion down to the SOC levels, where on the SOC we then have linear regulators or, or things like this to, to generate those 0.5 to 1 volt uh, power rails for that SOC. This is a fine solution. It works for many applications. However, it is heterogeneous multi-chip uh, integration, um, which we would prefer not to do, if at all possible, uh, as it does increase area and perhaps cost. Uh, this is particularly important for uh, very miniaturized IoT wearable kind of applications where space is a big premium. So what we'd prefer to do is integrate the functionality of the PMIC directly into the SOC and build a kind of an integrated power management unit. Uh, this would help uh, reduce the area and possibly the cost of our ultimate solutions. Uh, now, of course, the challenge is how do we actually implement this, this PMU into the scaled CMOS node um, without having uh, voltage rating issues on the transistors. So before we get there, let's just take a step back and say, what kind of DC-DC converters can we build? And, and why don't we just build a, a linear regulator or a low dropout regulator, an LDO? An LDO works basically by taking uh, some sort of pass transistor uh, and dropping a part of the input voltage here, uh, which is the battery, uh, across the resistance of this device in order to create a resistive divider that creates the desired output voltage, or VDD. So in theory, this, this works just fine. Uh, however, um, it's very inefficient. Okay, so you're, you're, you're dropping that, uh, that undesired voltage across a resistive load, which is directly resulting in power consumption. So if you go ahead and compute the ideal efficiency of a perfect LDO, you'll see that it's the output voltage, or VDD, divided by the input voltage, or the battery voltage. So if we wanted to convert from 4.2 volts down to, say, 0.8 volts, the best you could do with the linear regulator is 19% efficiency. That's not very good. We'd prefer to do better. A better strategy is to build a switching regulator. And the easiest way to understand how a switching regulator works is you take your input battery voltage, V in, and you have a switch and you switch between V in and ground. Okay, what this does is create a square wave uh, switching between V in and ground. We'll call this V in chopped of T. And this is obviously not a very good power supply. However, if one could perhaps filter this signal uh, through some low-pass filtering mechanism, you could take the average, and the average is going to be proportional to the duty ratio of this chopped waveform. Uh, in a classic buck converter, we do this with a second-order LC filter, uh, low-pass filter. Uh, and ideally, because um, we can use uh, pa passive uh, energy storing components, Ideally, the efficient efficiency can be 100%. Now, of course, in practice, we have non-ideal components. There's resistive losses in the inductor and so on. We don't quite get 100% efficiency, uh, but it is an upper bound. This is the basis for building buck converters. Um, let's go into a little bit more detail in this and see why it's challenging to do so in scaled CMOS. So a buck converter in CMOS would look something like this. We have uh, essentially an inverter. We have a PMOS and an NMOS uh, signal that's creating this V in chopped waveform. When the PMOS is on, uh, we are applying V in across the terminal of the uh, across the left terminal of the inductor, which causes the inductor current to ramp up in this phase. In the next phase, we turn off the PMOS and turn on the NMOS. We're applying ground uh, to this terminal of the inductor, which causes the inductor current to ramp down. Uh, and this cycle repeats. Um, this creates uh, the, the, the low-pass filter of this chopped square wave, which creates the uh, good DC voltage at the output. 
So the challenge we're running into in scaled CMOS here is that these transistors have to block the full input battery voltage. Okay, so when V in chopped is, is, is one, when the PMOS device is on, VDS across the PMOS device is effectively zero, but VDS across that NMOS device is the full battery voltage, in this example, 4.2 volts. Uh, so that's a problem. Likewise, when the PMOS switch is off and the NMOS switch is on, the VDS across the NMOS switch is very low, whereas the VDS across that PMOS switch is V in or the uh, full power supply. So because in scaled CMOS we don't have a 4.2 volt or higher voltage transistor available to us, we have to do something different. So the main solution here is to exploit transistor stacking. Uh, so when V in chopped is zero, for example, these NMOS transistors are on. In this case, we have three PMOS transistors stacked in a cas cascade. Um, and what this allows uh, it, these transistors to do is essentially each transistor sees uh, about one third of the, of the voltage uh, across its uh, drain to source terminal, provided that you have the gate terminal set appropriately. Uh, so the, and likewise, the, the same solution uh, occurs for the NMOS transistor. So if we had access to 1.5 volt transistors, which a lot of scaled CMOS processes do have, uh, then this solution works well. Now there are some challenges uh, with the solution. Each of these switches has to be upsized uh, to increase the, or rather decrease the resistance of the on state of these switches, such that the overall resistance is in line with what you expect for your uh, buck converter application. Uh, and uh, the other challenge is that these switches, you can't just drive these between zero and VDD or V out in this example. You have to drive them between different uh, supply levels, which may require auxiliary DC-DC converters in order to create these different rails, uh, as well as some uh, complicated level shifting uh, technologies uh, to, to generate these rails. So let's take an example of a, a sample implementation. Uh, this was in 45 nanometer, uh, published at ISSEC 2011. Uh, in this case, uh, the designer stacked three PMOS devices uh, in series. These are 1.8 volt CMOS devices and therefore can block uh, the full lithium ion battery range when these transistors are off. Now you'll see here that uh, the uh, gates of these PMOS devices do have to be uh, blocking interesting voltages here, or rather uh, being supplied interesting voltages here. Uh, this, bottom, uh, trans uh, this bottom switch here has to switch between VBAT minus 3.6 volts and VBAT minus 1.8 volts. Uh, this means that you gen need to generate these VBAT minus 1.8 and VBAT minus 3.6 volt supplies using an auxiliary DC-DC converter. In this particular work, this was done through an auxiliary switch capacitor DC-DC converter. This middle PMOS transistor, uh, it, it just stays statically biased at VBAT minus 1.8 volts. Uh, and this upper PMOS transistor has to switch between VBAT and VBAT minus 1.8 volts in order to ensure that the voltage uh, rating of the transistor is never exceeded. Now in this particular uh, implementation, uh, the designer could not stack NMOS transistors uh, because there was no uh, triple well process. You do have to be careful about where you set the bulk voltages of these transistors. But fortunately, they did have a drain extended NMOS transistor, which allows you to drive the NMOS transistor with the regular 0 to 1.8 volt uh, gate signals, uh, but the drain can withstand a larger uh, blocking voltage uh, when it's off. Uh, this uh, feedback signal, V out, goes into a control block that generates a pulse width modulation signal to keep the uh, uh, tr uh, circuit in the continuous conduction mode, or a pulse frequency modulation uh, signal to put it into discontinuous conduction mode uh, for uh, high efficiency over a wide output range. Uh, level shifters are included in order to appropriately drive these um, um, gate drivers. So this chip was implemented in 45 nanometer CMOS process. Uh, it's a couple square millimeters. Uh, importantly, there's a large uh, 10 microhenry off-chip inductor and a two microfarad off-chip uh, capacitor uh, to create that low-pass filter. But you can see here that in the efficiency versus load current results, the peak efficiency is, is quite good at 87%. Um, and importantly, they can operate over a very wide output current range uh, given the dual PWM slash PFM control technique. So this is one possible uh, way to build a DC-DC converter in scaled CMOS. So you might be asking, if, if we had to use an auxiliary switch capacitor DC-DC converter in the prior work, why don't we just build the whole converter with a switch capacitor converter? 
uh, capacitors can be easily integrated on chip. And in fact, uh, they actually have better energy and power density than uh, inductors typically do. So a switch capacitor circuit uh, looks something like this. This is a simple two to one circuit. Um, in one phase of the clock, we connect the capacitor uh, to the output in, in series like so. Uh, and in the second phase of the clock, we connect the, the capacitor more like in parallel to, to the load. Uh, so we have current uh, flowing in one direction in one phase and current flowing in the other direction in the other phase to ensure that the capacitor has a charge balance over the course of its switching cycle. Uh, because of this charge balance by Kirchhoff's voltage law, we say that the output voltage in this case, ideally, is half of the input voltage. This sounds great, um, and, and it is. Um, however, switch capacitor uh, DC-DC converters have topologically constrained conversion ratios. Uh, and what we mean by that is unlike a buck converter, which can change its conversion ratio simply by adjusting the duty cycle or the frequency of its input pulses, uh, a switch capacitor circuit, its conversion ratio is dictated by the topology or the arrangement of switches and capacitors. Uh, this limits the uh, ability to regulate over the wide desired input and output voltage ranges uh, from the lithium ion battery and the SOC voltages respectively. So in order to overcome this solution, uh, what we need is reconfigurable topologies, a switch capacitor circuit that can reconfigure between uh, different um, mechanisms of switching uh, in order to change what the uh, input to output conversion ratio is. So this is an example of a uh, solution that was published at ISSEC 2013. Uh, there's many other works uh, uh, that, that attempt to do this. Uh, but this is a good one, uh, in particular because the efficiency and power density of a switch capacitor converter is, 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 is predominantly dictated by the, the quality and density of capacitors. Uh, and it turns out that in most CMOS processes, the best capacitor you can get is a MOS capacitor. Um, but MOS capacitors tend to have high bottom plate losses. Um, eff effectively, when you're switching this capacitor up and down, the bottom plate of the capacitor has to charge up and down, and this results in a large uh, energy penalty. Uh, so we like the higher density of the MOS capacitors, but we don't like the large bottom plate losses. So there's a, a f several different solutions uh, emerging in the literature in recent years. Uh, in this particular work, they used uh, indeed MOS capacitors, uh, but they used a high impedance uh, connection to the substrate uh, in order to uh, alleviate the concerns of this bottom plate capacitor and really leverage the high density of the on-chip MOS capacitors. So in this particular work, it was implemented in 65 nanometer CMOS, um, and it used almost all low voltage transistors, uh, except for one. Um, and uh, it, it, we can take a look at the uh, die. It was about a square millimeter or so, uh, completely on-chip, full on-chip integration, uh, and achieved a very high power density of uh, 0.11 watts per square millimeter at pretty good efficiency, a peak efficiency of about 73% here. So this is a, a continuing research challenge in the switch capacitor field is it's difficult to include many ratios that are reconfigurable and that support lithium ion voltages at high efficiency and high power density. Um, there's been some other very interesting recent work that has attempted to address some of these problems, but it still remains an open research question on how to do this most effectively. The next topic is, well, we, we like our um, inductive converters because they're easy to generate the voltages that we need at the output. We like our switch capacitor converters because it's easy to fully integrate them and we have good on-chip capacitor technology. Why don't we try merging the two to create the best of both worlds? Uh, this is what we'd call a hybrid converter. Okay, so one simple example is we take a look at our two-level buck uh, or classic buck technology um, and this requires a stacking of three uh, transistors on either side of the inductor. The inductor switching node Vx here switches between zero and Vin uh, to create this chopped waveform. So the idea with a hybrid converter, uh, in this case a flying capacitor multi-level hybrid converter, is to say if we have to stack those transistors in order to block that voltage, why don't we go ahead and add some flying capacitors? These flying capacitors will help create some new voltage rails that allow the inductor voltage to switch between zero and Vn over three. This reduces the inductor switching voltage, which allows us to either use a smaller inductor, switch at a higher effective frequency. It, it, it allows us to improve our performance. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and, and, and say, let's implement this in uh, a scaled CMOS process, say 28 nanometer FDSOI, as we did uh, in uh, CICC 2018. So in this case, uh, it turns out that this flying capacitor one, CF1, has to block two thirds of the input voltage. Now this could potentially be a problem because in, in, in a lithium ion application, that's 2.8 volts, and in the employed technology we used, we could only block about 1.4 volts across our capacitors. This would require, would require us to stack the capacitors, which means we need for the same capacitance 4x the area, which decreases the power density of the converter. So simple modification uh, to the circuit to create a modified four level includes adding a couple switches, uh, these three switches in red here. Um, this results in a decreased voltage uh, drop across this CF1, which allows us to use a much larger CF1. Despite the increased losses of having these extra switches, it's overall a net win because we can use either a much larger CF1 for the same area, uh, or we can just employ a smaller CF1. Uh, these uh, red transistors are just used to limit the overstressing. So this converter works in the following manner. In phase one, we, sh we have current flowing in this direction towards the output. This charges up CF1 and CF2. In the next phase, we simply connect the output back to ground. This discharges the inductor. In the following phase, we charge down CF1 through the output and then switch back uh, to zero to uh, bring the inductor current back down. And then the following phase, we discharge CF2 in order to bring CF2 to charge balance. And then we again uh, take the inductor current back to ground. And then in this case, we are operating in the discontinuous conduction mode. So we enter a freewheeling phase after this. This converter was implemented in 28 nanometer FDSOI. Um, it was actually fully integrated. We even put the inductor right on the chip there. Uh, the total area of the converter is 1.5 square millimeters. And you can see here that uh, we could operate over a wide range thanks to the uh, PFM based uh, control technique. Um, and the peak efficiency with full on-chip integration was about 78% uh, using only uh, scaled CMOS transistors. In conclusion, uh, we can say that powering scaled CMOS SOCs directly from lithium ion battery voltages is extremely challenging. Uh, we have the limited voltage ratio of our scaled CMOS transistors. They can't block the full lithium ion range. We have high conversion ratios that uh, increase uh, the or decrease the efficiency of most converters. And if we want to do full on-chip integration, we have to deal with the fact that we're not going to have high quality on-chip passives. Uh, so given these constraints, there's three main, I would say, topological choices. We can build a stacked buck converter or several of its variants. There are multiple different switch capacitor based topologies. Uh, most of the ones that we prefer for high voltage blocking capabilities are something like the Ladder or the Dixon uh, because they can inherently block uh, higher voltages. But it is challenging to make these topologies into multi-ratio reconfigurable. Uh, so this is an ongoing research challenge. And then the third class is the hybrid technologies or the hybrid multi-level converters. If we have to stack those transistors, why don't we exploit the stack, add those flying capacitors and increase some functionality in the circuit, allowing for say a decrease in the in inductor area or switching frequency, something like this. Um, so the bottom line is this is hard, uh, but there are some techniques that allow us to get there and there are many exciting ongoing research challenges moving forward. Thank you very much.